Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Perkins, who is a senior program officer with LISC National Safety and Justice Program. So he's been part of this organizing team as well. Uh, he'll serve as moderator and presenter in this session. So thank you, Matt. Thank you to Cardi and Cornell and Helene for all your work. Um, I'm gonna talk for a little bit about the why of, of LIS being involved in safety and justice work, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Captain Henry Ramalina of Providence Police Department. Providence Police Department has been a strong partner of LISC for many years. Uh, and we've seen a city and a department kind of transformed by that partnership. And then we'll hear from Alejandro Jimenez Santana of Rutgers University who will really be able to talk about kind of the research basis for the type of work we're talking about and Rutgers um, initiative in Newark, also with the local LISC office. Um, I'd like to, to, well, first let me ask, how many of you in this room regularly meet with the local police department to talk about priorities and priority locations? Okay, so four, and one of them at least is code enforcement, I think. Um, and I find in talking to housing offices, it, it's good to discuss like what police departments do on a daily basis uh, and, and why it's so important for us to help them and work with them. And I, I'm constantly thinking of and reminded of, of an experience I had in Kansas City. I work as a technical assistance provider to the US Department of Justice on violence prevention initiatives and was on a site visit one time. And usually they're, they're pretty commonplace. Um, you see a lot of non-emergencies, a lot of mental health issues. Uh, and I was riding along with Officer Brad Bailey of the Kansas City Police Department. Um, Brad didn't want to be a police officer at first. He wanted to join the fire department, but couldn't get in. So became a police officer and was assigned to this unit that was doing, it was a program called the KC No Violence Alliance. And it, it was a unit that implemented um, a program that would take gang involved violent offenders and try and hook them up with social services to get them out of the life. And so we started off, it was a pretty normal shift uh, for right along. The, the biggest problem in the beginning was Brad's gas card wouldn't work at the municipal gas station. And as we're driving around uh, the prospect corridor area, those who are familiar with Kansas City, um, We'll then know that as a neighborhood that's kind of a high, high violence neighborhood. And we got a call to respond to a shooting. We rolled up to a gas station convenience mart right about sundown. Uh, we were the second or third car to arrive. And as Brad parks, he opens the door. I, of course, know to stay in the car for something like that and gets out and says, that's my guy. And so as we watched this scene unfold in the parking lot, um, this is a young member who had been working with Brad to get out of the gang life. He'd been going to meetings, started going to school, hadn't been able to cut his ties with fellow gang members, had been shot. When we got there, he was a little responsive. Uh, by the time the ambulance arrived four or five minutes later, uh, the paramedics started chest compressions right away. And they take him off to the hospital. Um, once the chest compressions start, that's not good. And so I was there for a couple hours as the scene unfolded. And in the neighborhoods in which we work, which are areas of concentrated distress, they unfortunately get more than their fair share of these. It was a early spring day, the kind where it's warm when it's sunny and then quickly gets cold. There was a mother with her infant 
who had just stopped by to get gas at the wrong time and was there for hours to be interviewed. Getting cold, she wasn't dressed for it, couldn't go home. Uh, the, the family of the man who'd been shot arrived shortly after he left to the hospital. Nobody there to help them except the police officers who could tell him which hospital he was going to. Friends who showed up having heard about what happened. And for most of the people there, it was probably the worst day of their life. For Brad Bailey, who had got there and over the course of a couple minutes, watched his work and the life of the man who'd been shot, drift off into the ether. It was a day ending in Y. He would go to work the next day, probably not respond to the same thing, but maybe respond to a car accident or he would see bodies broken and torn in ways that bodies weren't meant to be. Um, go into a house where children were present, where the house is not being kept up in any state fit for humans. And I bring this up um, because when we think of crime and justice, we often think of the police and think, oh, that's their job. Um, and if you ride along with police, you'll notice that probably the largest piece of time they spend in aggregate is dealing with mental health issues that don't get addressed, that have seen cities and counties and states pull back resources, that have seen cities, counties, and states ignore the resources needed by the officers who are responding. And, um, you know, in a lot of, in, in the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of inexcusable things on the news and the, the national conversation, disappointingly to me, is more about why don't they change than it is about why can't they change and, and what is our role. Um, so we find ourselves in a situation where policing challenges include these insular agencies that aren't used to working with people who just keep dumping more projects on them, more problems to deal with where there's a crisis in confidence and legitimacy, confidence in policing organizations and the legitimacy of the officers who work there. It's led to a recruiting crisis in policing. Most large agencies I deal with are short hundreds of officers because nobody wants to take on that job that they see on YouTube or on the news which means that the officers who do work there get longer shifts and more overtime. And they're also faced with the challenge of how to continue and maintain a great crime decline, which has in the last 20 to 25 years seen violent crime have, not just in New York, much more, a much greater decline in New York City, not just there, not just the United States, but in all of the industrialized world. Much of that is not due to police activity or criminal justice activity. Um, I'm gonna recommend a book if you're interested in kind of what you can do as a community organization or as a developer to help with safety and crime reduction. Uneasy Peace, The Great Crime Decline, The Renewal of City Life and the Next War on Violence by Patrick Sharkey. He's the first author I've really seen who can kind of quantify the impacts of community groups on crime. Um, yeah, and so what is our role? And how does LIS get into something like safety? And I'm gonna blast through some slides because Lean talked about what LISC is and what our reach and what we do and and a big part of LISC's work, for those who've, who've, who have not worked with us, is to make sure that our local partners are taking into account community needs and community priorities. And not surprisingly, in talking to local groups that needed development work in the late 80s, early 90s, safety came up a lot. And so in nine, 1994, 
LISC established the safety and justice program. And so we work with local partners to reduce crime, but also reduce blight, develop more of a voice for residents, increase collaboration between community groups and law enforcement, and sharing the tools and lessons learned. And why would we do this? But what we have learned about crime, and especially the importance of place in relation to crime, is, um, is a lot, frankly. And, and one of those things, the law of crime concentration, or the 80-20 rule. The idea that even in what we consider a bad neighborhood, very few physical spaces are responsible for a large proportion of the crime that occurs. We've learned the myths of di displacement, right? It, it's a common, it's been throughout my career, a common reaction to the idea of crime reduction programs, even from people who should know better. Well, it's just gonna go somewhere else. And the fact of the matter is, for the most part, it goes away. Um, because, oh, I put the crime triangle up here. Um, the idea under situational crime prevention for any crime to happen, three elements need to be in place. There needs to be an offender, a victim, but there also needs to suitable, be a suitable environment for that to happen. And so if you as LISC or a LISC partner or really anybody in a community can interrupt the place and the environmental part of that, then, then you have a chance to reduce crime. The last speaker spoke about the greening of lots. Um, Pennsylvania Horticultural Society in Philadelphia does that on a regular basis. Their studies find not just reduced crime and reduced violent crime at the lots, but in several blocks surrounding it. Uh, one of the earlier speakers talked about health benefits to green places and public housing in Chicago. It was kind of an accidental experiment at Robert Taylor Holmes, maybe a different study. Um, but because the different towers were controlled by different managers, some of whom had more of a predilection for concrete, uh, they were able to look at different towers, look at their surroundings, and found that those towers in which green spaces had been maintained, crime was lower. Um, again, diffusion of benefits. Not only does crime not displace, when you make a place better, the places around it become better, right? Um, but we can't ignore the social ecology of where we're looking at. Uh, that was a big mistake. We were talking about broken windows when somebody mentioned it before uh, and having this discussion. And my big talking point around broken windows is, is always um, for people trying to draw lessons from the original study as it was conducted in a way that made those lessons fatally flawed. The first study of broken windows or the study the article was based on happened in the New York City subway system. What's wrong with that? when you're designing an approach based on that for a community. Very few people live in the New York City subway system. So as a law enforcement agency, you can come into that place and fill a void as opposed to coming into a neighborhood where people are there 24 seven and the needs are different. And so departments that have really gotten in trouble with broken windows policing are those that haven't taken into account the community element of it. How do we operationalize and understand collective efficacy and social cohesion? Basically, do you trust your neighbors? Do you feel they, they share your interests and social cohesion? Do you use your neighborhood resources? Do you go shopping in your neighborhood? Use the library, use the park? Because what we find is that in areas where social cohesion and collective efficacy are higher, regardless of all other variables, crime is lower. And then crime prevention through environmental design. How do we change the physical environment to make it less conducive? Again, changing, changing the environment in which crime can take place. And so because of all these things we've learned, this safety and justice tries to work with local police through local developers in two ways, increasing the community collaborative approach to get police departments to work with other organizations and change the way they work. Um, 
and to do that through targeted problem solving, right? Being analytical, finding those few places, again, even in a bad neighborhood, the few places that account for most crime. So for a developer, an example might be working with police department as um, one neighborhood builders did. That's their new name. If you, Old, Old Neville Housing Corporation is the old name. Working with LISC and Providence Police Department in the Olneyville section of Rhode Island, which is a lower income area, transient area, one of the tougher areas of the city. And a particularly bad spot was on Aleppo Street, which bordered an abandoned industrial facility. And on Aleppo Street was the Blue House. Blue House was famous within Olneyville. Henry's smiling. Um, as a drug location, both for sales and use, was responsible for an extraordinary amount of the problems in the neighborhood that, that had enough to deal with. Um, working with LISC and One Neighborhood Builders, we were able to get rid of the Blue House and replace it with affordable housing. Um, and with that collaborative partnership in place, we're also to find and work with some environmentally oriented groups to redevelop the industrial facility as a Riverside Park. And that sounds good, but this is a process that took years, obviously, right? With the kind of work that was being done and it takes years to develop relationships with, a, with an agency that's not used to working with these kinds of partnerships. Um, but even in the design of this park, Providence Police Department were brought in to talk about how can we develop it? Because originally this bike path you see in the picture was gonna go right along the river. Um, and the police department said, that's great, but my, my officers will never get out and walk all the way to the river to check. But if you can put it within view of somebody patrolling along the street here, then they can keep an eye on it and people will feel, will feel safer when, when they're there. And so what? Results, right? So Aleppo Street, a small street segment right along that industrial facility and with the Blue House accounted for well over three times what it should have in terms of geographic area for calls for service before this intervention. Afterwards, it was down to normal. Um, but it becomes then about more than just a house. Providence Police Department, and, and if you want to change a police department, give yourself at least 10 years. Um, but Henry is now probably the fourth person from Providence Police Department who's been on a panel like this with me talking authoritatively about collaborative relationships with developers, right? Um, Betsy mentioned before, in the last panel or the panel before, uh, when she was asked about housing, housing is something somebody else does. When I came on, I, I didn't know what development was. My background was in community-based crime prevention and I've tried to get across to everybody I work and talk to about safety in the development world. Um, cops have no idea how the development world works. Um, Somebody asked me about my exposure to development before coming on a list. I was like, it's great. Sometimes somebody comes in and changes things and you don't know how it happens, but it's usually good. Right. So recognize there's a lot of work to explain what you do and to get them to understand. Uh, but when an agency. Agencies are looking for these partnerships. You go into a police station and say, how can I help you? And you blow them away. They don't even know how to answer the question, honestly, the first time you ask. Um, but it changes the way they operate. We talked about mental health. Providence Police Department, uh, working with the local LISC office, now has a program where they have clinicians on patrol. Clinicians actually ride along on shifts so that when they respond to calls, if it's a mental health issue, they can have an, a, a clinician at the call within minutes instead of having to call in somewhere and maybe taking a couple hours. Um, 
It helps get police back on the street. It helps them from trying to step into a situation in which they're not really trained to deal with. And anecdotally, it helps officers to ride around in a police car talking to a clinician. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Henry, who's gonna talk about what this looks like in practice um, and encourage you to reach out to your police departments, expect them not to understand how it goes. We can help explain that if you need partners to join that conversation. Uh, but knowing that over the long term, you can have tremendous uh, changes in the way you do work and in the way those around you and in your city work and the effects on health and safety in your communities. Um, yeah, you can have an impact in ways you don't anticipate. 